Good evening. Welcome to the Manistee City Council meeting. Tonight is Tuesday, January 18th, 2022. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heather, will you please take the roll call? Councilmember Bachman. Here. Mayor Beaton. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Here. Councilmember Shemansky. Here. Councilmember Grabowski. Here. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Here. City Manager. Here. City Attorney. Here. DPW Director. Here. Finance Director. Here. Police Chief. Here. Fire Chief. Here. Roll call complete. Thank you, Heather. Public hearings, we have one. Uh, the, there's going to be a public hearing on the adoption of the Brownfield plan for the area in the vicinity of 101 Lakeshore Drive located in the city of Manistee. The purpose of the public hearing is to give each citizen or interested party an opportunity to speak for five minutes on the proposed brown up to five minutes on the proposed brownfield plan for the hotel ventures manistee llc redevelopment at this time the public is invited to step forward uh, for their for their opportunity to speak for, for up to five minutes on the plan do we have anybody who would like to speak Anybody at all? <clears throat> no action is anticipated at the conclusion of the public hearing. However, this matter is on the agenda for consideration later this evening in case you change your mind. I guess at this point, I'm going to have to call, call the public hearing closed. Citizens comments on agenda related items. This is an opportunity for citizens to comment on agenda related items only. Citizens in attendance shall be recognized by the mayor for comments limited to five minutes. Letters submitted to council will not be publicly read. Again, do we have any public that would like to come forward and make any comments on tonight's agenda related items? Hearing none, I'll move on to the consent agenda. All agent, uh, agenda items marked with an asterisk are on the consent agenda and considered by the city manager to be routine matters. Prior to the approval of the consent agenda, any member of council may have an item from the consent agenda removed and taken up during the regular portion of the meeting. Consent agenda items include approval of minutes, payroll, invoices, Notification regarding, regarding next study session. At this time, council could take action to approve the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Thank you. <clears throat> Heather, can you take the roll call? Council Member Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Council Member Shemansky. Yes. Council Member Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Unfinished business, we have none. Under new business, consideration of establishing the 2022 poverty exemption guidelines as approved by the State <coughs> Next Commission. The governor recently signed significant legislation concerning the poverty exemptions. The city of Manistee needs to make some changes to our guidelines to become compliant with the state tax commission bulletin three of 2021. The new act also takes away the ability of the board of review to deviate from the standards. The proposed changes to the policy mirror the information in bulletin of 2021. At this time, council could take action to approve the resolution establishing 2022 poverty exemption guidelines. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second. 
Could you give us a little bit of background on this? I don't see much. Yeah, and our assessor isn't here today. Just briefly, every year, the uh, federal, federal poverty standards are published annually and adopted by the state tax commission. So this is asset determination for poverty guidelines and also income standards. So basically it, it takes away, as you stated, the ability for our tax tribunal to deviate from that. So this is just standardizing it with the state and making sure everyone understands, you know, what's going to be expected in terms of assets and income before they could qualify. Any discussion? Do we anticipate this having an increase or a decrease on the number of people who would be eligible for the exemption? And I know that's a difficult question, but just assuming what... I mean, I don't think the standards themselves will make that much difference. It's really a product of who's in the community and kind of what their state is. Molly did say when I spoke to her earlier that we only have eight poverty exemptions in the city. Um, that's down quite a bit from, from the past. So either people are um, doing better or they don't feel like they want to avail themselves of that. We do advertise the, you know, the availability of that. But I think the changes to the standards here really won't have an impact one way or another. There's a lot of other factors that, that have a bigger impact on that. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Mayor. How the can take the roll call? Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Councilmember Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Bachman. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of the purchase of a 2022 Ford Explorer from Garnell Ford. The Manistee City Police Department utilizes an unmarked police vehicle as part of the police fleet. This vehicle is assigned to Detective Sergeant, to the Detective Sergeant. Currently the vehicle is a 2010 Ford Escape and is at the end of its life cycle. Bids, bids have been solidified from Michigan deals, participants, as well as other dealerships up and upfitting, upfitting companies. One Ford dealership and one upfitting company have been identified based on the pricing and need for recommendation. At this time, council could take action to authorize the purchase of a 2022 Ford Explorer from Gornal Ford for $31,279 and be uplifted by Telrad for $1,154. I'll make that motion. Second. I bet you'd like to tell us more about it, Chief Glass. I just want to clarify that council approved this in July through Watson's and Manistee. They recently advised us they're unable to get that vehicle for us. So we went to the drawing board, so to speak. To be clear, this vehicle is about uh, $3,600 more than was previously approved. However, it is $2,500 under budget, budget for that purchase. Uh, so we hope to, uh, if council so approves it tonight, we can make a phone call in the morning and hopefully this vehicle is still available. Uh, but as you know, because of supply chain issues, vehicles are extremely difficult to, to obtain. Will this vehicle have the, the double uh, battery pack so you won't have to run it all the time? It won't. This, this vehicle won't have the computer equipment in it. It'll, it'll have a radio and lights. It, it'll be a, basically a standard vehicle with a little bit of upfitting for a detective sergeant. Okay. Not like the one that we were going to get from. Correct. Thanks. Great. I, I don't have a problem with this at all. Can't we just write this differently? I, we just we had the same problem with Jeff and the, the truck. I don't know if we can because we already approved this, so we're not really approving it again. We're only approving what thirty six hundred dollars. I think for I transparency, you approved the purchase of one vehicle from a different company. This is a complete different purchase. So I, for transparency purposes, I think it's important to come back to council and say, hey, this is a specific request. Here's the differences. Here's the yeah. details to but it. But I'm saying the way that we're wording this, because we're not approving this amount again. You know what I mean? Well, you're clearly not spending the amount we approved before on a different vehicle, right. correct? You're, you're using a different amount that we're requesting. Okay, but you're not spending that money we requested this summer for the direct. Right. You're going to spend it here on this vehicle. Yes. So she's, I understand what you're saying, but I also understand what you did. Yeah. You know, in other I words, like it, some kind of a, in lieu of the previous vehicle, we're purchasing this one. 
Okay. Absolutely. Which is in the memo, but not in the motion. Mm -hmm. Say that again? I, it's in the memo, but okay. not in the motion. I don't is that the issue? It's, uh, uh, okay, okay. I'll make sure that. I did it earlier when I was asking Jeff about a different thing. Like, we weren't approving the full amount, we were only approving like 30000 and he had the full amount in there, so it looks like we're approving like another 70000 when we actually weren't, you know what I mean? Like, I'll make sure that difference finds its way in the motion. It just, it just looks weird. Yeah, certainly. Like, I don't have a problem with this at all. It's just the way that it was worded. I don't have any more questions either at this point. Are we going to amend the motion or not? Um, do we need to amend the motion or? I think ultimately we're approving a vehicle for this amount. I mean, the other purchase is off the table at this point. I'm not certain what specifically what the problem is with language, but. Well, I think you're good approving it as is. Mm -hmm. The council person Sullivan's made a note here publicly of you know, how this isn't uh, buying a second vehicle, uh, which I think was the concern. But if you want to amend the motion, you certainly could do that. No, I don't, we and don't I, need to do that. I just, going forward, just the way that it's worded, like we're not buying. Yeah, so they're just approving the okay. motion as it is. All right, so I'll go ahead and take roll. Yes. Okay. Council Member Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Council Member Shemansky. Yes. Council Member Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of authorization for entering a clinical agreement with West Shore Community College. The Manistee Fire Department will collaborate with West Shore Community College to provide a clinical site for students to obtain required assessment time on an ambulance. This agreement would allow students in the EMT slash paramedic program to assess points under the super supervision of a city fire par paramedic to meet the program required benchmarks in order to obtain state and national licensing. At this time, council could take action to authorize entering into a clinical agreement with West Shore Community College and the City of Manistee Fire Department. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. No second. Any questions or, this is the same type of agreement that we entered in with Munson Health um, just that we're doing it with the college and their program right now is currently an EMT program uh, but that may down the road change into a paramedic program which will carry over as well. Wow, you're turning it into a teaching center. Well, we're trying to help out. I think that's great. Anybody have any questions or comments? I just think Chief, you did a good job filling out that whole information you gave us. That was a lot to Okay. I read the whole thing. They followed basically the same clinical agreement that Munson had set forth. That's what the little more delay was, just getting them to be on board with the same programs. I think it's a win-win for the fire service, too. They get an extra set of hands in the ambulance. Because some days, two more hands in the back of that truck working on a rig is, is nice to have. And if they're learning at the same time, it's just good for us. It puts some burden on your medics to Any train and evaluate, <coughs> but it's not, not offset by the help they get having someone in the truck. It's nice for them to get the opportunity to teach, too. That kind yeah. of helps them Absolutely. kind of grow a little more. It, yeah, it definitely refreshes your, exactly. your skills, and, and that's valuable as well. Are they going to practice traffic control, too, if you're at an accident? Not usually. We keep them at a, in a safe zone, so we, we don't put them out as any part of a primary function. It's more one-on-one -on -one coaching in the back of the ambulance and we, we don't use them as true personnel. Okay. We're using them as, as a teaching a teaching moment with them. They are doing the one-on-one -on -one care in the back with the supervision of one of our medics, though. Okay. okay. Right. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Heather, go ahead and take the roll call. Council Member Shemansky. Yes. Council Member Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Martin Pontiac. Yes. Council Member Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of a brownfield plan for the Hotel Ventures Manistee LLC redevelopment project. Earlier this evening, a public hearing was held on the proposed brownfield plan 
for the Hotel Ventures Manistee LLC redevelopment project. The City of Manistee Brownfield Rede Redevelopment Authority has approved the Brownfield Plan. Public Act 381 of 1996 requires that the, the municipality where the project is located to also approve the plan. At this time, Council could take action to adopt a resolution approving the Brownfield Plan for the Hotel Ventures Manistee LLC redevelopment. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Or Thank you. Discussion? This is pretty much what we expect, anticipated coming based on our action a month or two ago and then it went to the county, correct? The county approved it and it just bounces back our direction. Is that correct, Ed? Is, is this was an anticipated event? It is. Um, and I put together just a little presentation just to kind of refresh everybody and for the benefit of the public as well. We also do have um, members of the development team here as well as a representative from Fishbeck who is the Brownfield Authority's environmental advisor if there's questions as I go through. Um, just a little review of the timeline. Um, way back in December 2020, if you recall, we had a meeting at the Ramsdale Theater where there was a presentation to council about the development by the developer. And then in May of 2021, the Planning Commission approved the site plan after um, a number of meetings um, and a lot of public input. In October of 21, there was a council work session discussion of the project and its incentives. Uh, in November of 2021, council held a public hearing on establishing a commercial rehabilitation district, which is one of the incentives that's being provided to this project. December of 2021, um, the Brownfield Authority reviewed the Brownfield application that was submitted by the developer. And then in January, the Brownfield Authority for the city of Manistee approved the Brownfield plan. So this is a city Brownfield project, not a, a county Brownfield project. Um, again, in January uh, tonight, you're going to be considering the Brownfield plan and the development agreement. Um, in February, there'll be a public hearing in consideration of the commercial rehabilitation abatement. Uh, in February, we're hoping to have the Brownfield Authority also approve the work plan for the Brownfield plan. And then sometime in March, uh, maybe April, we'll hopefully get all the state approvals that are needed. Just a quick overview of the Brownfield plan. This was prepared by the Brownfield Authority's consultant, Fishbeck, uh, in consultation with the developer. Um, and it was, it's a fairly straightforward Brownfield plan. It funds eligible activities such as investigation of environmental uh, issues, demolition, lead and asbestos abatement, site preparation, infrastructure, public infrastructure, and a revolving fund. The total cost in the Brownfield plan are about 1.55 million. Uh, 758,000 of those are developer costs. About 505,000 are city or 509,000 are city costs. There's an additional 32,000 Brownfield uh, Authority administration fee that'll be collected over the life of the plan. And then after all the reimbursements have been made, there's a $250,000 to establish a Brownfield revolving fund. The duration of the plan is estimated to be 18 years. However, it's authorized for a maximum of 30 or until the reimbursement to all the parties is complete. That's to give a little bit of flexibility if there's some hiccup on the amount of taxable value, but we don't anticipate that. It's probably going to be around 18 years. And again, the Brownfield Authority did approve this plan at their January 10th meeting. Uh, the development and reimbursement agreement is uh, the second thing that's on your agenda tonight, and that's a three-party agreement that's required by the state uh, that's between the developer and the city and the Brownfield Authority. And it basically spells out the terms and agreements by which each parties get reimbursed from the taxes that are captured by the Brownfield Authority. This agreement was drafted by the city with input from Fishbeck and was approved by um, the city attorney as well as the developer's attorney through the negotiation process. The agreement basically specifies how the reimbursement will be captured from the captured revenues will be made and um, basically the developer will get 75% uh, and the city 25% of the available revenues to get reimbursed. So the developer will get reimbursed a little bit quicker but they also have more costs and then the city will finish up and then finally after both parties have been reimbursed then the revolving fund gets funded over a couple year period. <coughs> Um, it also, and this is an important part of this agreement, it specifies in quite a bit of detail what documentation that the developer and the city have to provide to the Brownfield Authority so that they can review it and make sure that everything is uh, acceptable. And again, that agreement was approved by the Brownfield Authority on January 10th. Um, I wanted to go over a little bit of the tax impact. This is similar to what we had, we had said before, but I thought I'd show it again. Um, the 2022 taxable value is the base for both the abatement and the Brownfield. 
And the 22, 22 taxable value is about four and a half times higher than it was in 2021. And that's because Molly did a reappraisal on the, on the property um, prior to the end of the, or the beginning of the 2021 tax year. So the taxable value for 2022 um, will go up to 871,500 and it's going to generate about $54,000 in total taxes uh, about 16,500 that is to the city. So that's an increase of again about 4.5 times the, the property as it stands was only generating about $12,000 in taxes. So those base taxes will always stay they will always go to the taxing jurisdictions. The tax abatement in the brownfield plan work on values above that. Um, so just to make that clear, there's going to be a significant bump in the amount of tax going to the taxing jurisdictions, even though we're giving an abatement potentially and approving a brownfield plan. And that should still go up regardless over the course of the 18 years, for example. Well, the, the value of the, the existing building is frozen. The land value will go up. That's what I'm yeah. referring to. Yeah, but it should land. go up by the rate of, in, you know, rate of inflation roughly. Um, public infrastructure, I uh, just wanted to go through the other kind of benefits of the Brownfield plan. Um, in the Brownfield plan, there's a, uh, it's intended to resurface the loop starting at about the fish cleaning station, going all the way around uh, both sides to the roundabout. There's also be some improvements in the parking lot, some curb and gutter, and some sidewalk, and the estimated cost of that is about $300,000. Um, there's going to be a water main loop that is going to loop from the end of Harbor Drive down and around and hook up with First Street. And that loop will eliminate a dead end in the city's water system, so it should help improve water quality. It'll help improve the volume available for fire flows as well. Um, the cost of that's about 315000 The developer is going to pay for half of that in the engineering up front. The city is going to pay half of the construction up front, but both parties will get reimbursed through the Brownfield plan. Uh, there's additional parking along the loop drive. I believe it's 20 spaces. They're indicated roughly here. And that's to uh, just provide a benefit to the general public uh, in, in lieu of some of the things that are given and also uh, giving them access to the big parking lot during real peak periods. So it's, it's really a win-win because those are areas that will, the public will use quite a bit, I think, with those parking. The cost of that's about 51200 and then some shared infrastructure, there's a, a stormwater detention basin that will serve both the property, the development, and the city in some of our places where we have ponding issues. And then there's an additional parking lot entry into the big parking lot. Um, the developer is paying for both of those, but again, they'll get reimbursed. And the cost of that is about 61000 for the first and 44000 for the second. So there is quite a bit of, uh, of infrastructure being done as part of this project, as well as the eligible. I don't know if there's any questions regarding the Brownfield plan or the development agreement that was in the packet. I just have one question, um, or maybe a couple, but it shows a $509,000 city cost, also shows reimbursement. Walk me through what that $509,000 is for and how that gets reimbursed, or where's the money come from? Sure. How long did you get back? So, so the 500000 is primarily the paving of the loop, resurfacing of that, and then our portion of the water main. That gets paid out of the water fund, and it gets paid for out of the street funds, and then we get reimbursed for that over time from, from the taxes how that are paid to get it back. What's that? How long do you anticipate to get it back? So the plan calls for 18 years, so it so, should be an 18-year payback roughly. Okay. Yep. I've got a question. It's a little bit off the wall. We started talking about this in December 2020. Um, I recognize the city staff and all the departments have had, and Spicer Group, have had a big part in working with the developer. Can you guesstimate how many hours city staff has spent on this? Because I think you guys have done a tremendous job, and I'm trying to figure out how many hours that would have been with all of the players that have been in touch with this project. The city manager asked me that, and I think he put some pencil to paper and has a rough estimate if you want to speak to that. Yeah, I think looking at the finance director Ed's time, he spent a lot of time on this, the assessor, clerk, city attorney, planning department, planning commission, city council. I think we're talking hundreds of hours of, of city time and working with the developers. So I think it's in Mark Miller's time. So it's, yeah, it was a substantial amount of time that that everyone, including council, spent on this project. Um, and I, I would like to point out, though, too, I, just like with the South Washington area project, I mean, it's the same thing. When these pr big projects like this happen, everybody puts in a lot of time on them, but it just kind of goes with the territory. It's part of the, part of the job um, working for the city and being involved in that sort of thing. 
This is a pretty substantial one. So. It, it, it is, but the, the brownfield plan itself, at least from my perspective, is, is more straightforward than what we had over on the brewery. That was a more complex brownfield plan. So. Okay. Jeff, that water that sits there by the tennis courts, is that water that comes down off a of cherry and then crosses those uh, tennis courts and that's what ruined them or what? After we had it when we When we robbed the sand out of that park from Cherry Street to about the tennis courts, if you remember one of our CSO projects, we mined all the sand out of that area, filled it back with clay. We graded it and put a retention basin in so that water didn't impact the park. The puddle that you're talking about, um, most of that comes right off the tennis courts because of that hard surface. And, uh, but it's also the low part that, uh, especially you know, this time of year and in the spring when the ground is froze, um, ponds a lot. So um, this, is, this project would drain that area and clean that up. That's gonna dry and drain it into the retention pond then? Correct. Okay. That area, and then if you look at the plan that's on the screen, it also draws water from right. uh, over by the pavilion as well, the, the concession stand. Okay, I wanted to know that. Thank you. Does anybody have any more questions? Or again, the developers here as well as the Brownfield consultant, if there's any questions uh, of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Council members, do you have any comments on this project before we vote? Just glad that it's continuing to work its way through the system. <laughs> I know, it's been amazing. All right, I guess we're ready for a roll call vote. Okay, Council Member Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Council Member Shemansky. Yes. Council Member Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Ma Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of a development and reimbursement agreement for the Hotel Ventures Manistee LLC redevelopment project. Earlier this evening, a public hearing was held on the proposed brownfield plan for the Hotel Ventures Manistee <coughs> redevelopment project. Council also considered approving the brownfield plan as part of the approval process for the project, a development and reimbursement agreement between the city developer and Brownfield Redevelopment Authority needs to be approved. At this time, council could take action to enter into a development and reimbursement agreement with Hotel Ventures Manistee LLC and the city of Manistee Brownfield Redevelopment Authority and further authorize the mayor to execute the agreement. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. A second. Thank you. Discussion? So is there any um, liabilities for the city that the council needs to be aware of under this plan? Directed to me? Yes. Uh, I can't imagine the uh, liability situation that we would would need to discuss or address with that, no. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Heather, can you take a roll call? Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Council Member Shemansky. Yes. Council Member Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Martin Pontiac. Yes. Council Member Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Notices, communications, and announcements. We were supposed to have a report from the Manistee Recreational Recreation Association tonight, but unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Miss Erica Kramer uh, was not able to attend tonight. So that will not be discussed. Um, now I think it's, we're back to citizens' comment. This is an opportunity for citizens to comment on municipal services, activities, or areas of city involvement. Citizens in attendance shall be recognized by the mayor for comments limited to five minutes. Letters submitted to council will not be publicly read. 
I see a hand up. Would you like to step forward? Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Marty Spaulding, uh, 259 River Street. You might know that better as the Milwaukee House. Yeah. Uh, seems like a long time ago to me now, but 25 years ago, I was a city commissioner <laughs> for several years. I have a full appreciation for what you're doing up there. I don't miss the midnight calls about barking dogs or loud music or people coming to the commission meetings to vent. We've been working on the Milwaukee House uh, and a deli project across the street from the House of Flavors for a few years now. And I've invested about a million and a half dollars to date. We've got about an acre and a half, eight parcels contiguous down there. We haven't asked for a penny in grants, tax abatements, anything else. We're just kind of minding our own business and getting our work done. We're not horribly far away. Building during a pandemic has been a real treat. In addition to COVID, we've had the side effects of wildly fluctuating materials and other costs, supply chain issues, labor issues for most of our contractors, just getting people to show up. We had anticipated opening up this year, both businesses. We've had a series of delays from a number of issues, but that's not why I'm here tonight. On November the 3rd, as part of your consent agenda, you adopted Zoning Ordinance Amendment Z2118. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, this was part of your consent agenda. There wasn't really any discussion about it or even individual consideration on its scope or its necessity. The essence of the ordinance amendment is pretty simple. You changed the definition in your zoning code of what is included in lot coverage. Prior to this change, what was included in that calculation was the percentage ratio of a lot and the buildings on the lot. The definition has now been changed to include not only buildings, but decks, patios, pretty much paved areas, anything that's covered. In most any district outside the central business district, C1 and the C2 district now, every piece of property in Manistee is gonna be required by zoning to maintain between at least 40 or as much as 60% green space that you can't touch for anything now. You can't put a new patio, you can't put some paving block down and put out a picnic table and a barbecue grill in your own backyard. This is even considering the compensation for setbacks. This amendment includes hundreds of properties in Manistee, including the Milwaukee House, in a very serious and negative fashion. As to my project, over time, behind the Milwaukee House, I've acquired three additional properties. The old Michigan Bell service garage that was about ready to fall down anyway, and two houses to the west of that that were owned by the Raz Brothers. The Michigan uh, Bell building has been demolished, and I was planning on taking out the easternmost of the Raz Brothers houses as well so that we could have a parking lot. The site plan has been underway this summer. Spicer Group was working on it. They've been in contact with the Public Works Department, dealing with the surface water issues. We spent $10,000 on that plan. We spent $250,000 buying the property back there. Earlier this month in January, I think it was the 3rd or 4th of January, I made contact with the planning people to go over some final details before we submitted it, only to discover that we were no longer allowed to have a parking lot there. Under the new definition of lot coverage, I now have to have 40% green space. So I'm now going to have a $250,000 lawn that I don't need and no parking lot that I do need. The shorter version of this is that this amendment is going to put the Milwaukee House out of business before it serves its first meal. A restaurant without parking is a non-starter. 
Mr. Spaulding, you got 10 seconds left. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for telling us about that. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to make public comment? and I reside at 380 12th Street. And regarding the whole hotel thing, I know there's a lot of keyboard warriors out there and I haven't heard anything mentioned, but has there been any thought or consideration into fencing in Rotary Park? It's already kind of nerve wracking as a parent, um, but with increased traffic due to the hotel, it, uh, it's, it's a little nerve wracking and I think it would be very beneficial. It's one of our go-to parks for playgroups. And uh, yeah, just want to throw that out there. Keep the children safe. <laughs> Sorry, public speaking is not my thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was not aware. I haven't heard anything. If that was mentioned, is that something that we can budget? I mean, even if it's just the side that is facing the road, that would help. I mean, it's not, we've got a lot of children. We have some special need children that come to our play group and any parent or anyone that works with children knows I work at MAPS. It takes just a second for a child to run after a ball or decide that they want to go adventure. So yeah, tossing that out there. Okay. Right, thank you. Do we have anybody else who would like to make public comment? Hearing none, uh, moving on to uh, officials and staff. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so regarding the fencing issue, I know it didn't make it into the Brownfield plan, but it was discussed and talking with Mr. Bradford, we're, during the budget process, we're gonna be looking at how to fund that. So that is something we'll be looking at. The, Another update, um, lot coverage. I did speak with Mr. Spaulding as well as the planning department, and they have some ideas of how to, to work on this issue with them, so I'll be contacting them tomorrow about that. A couple other updates. <clears throat> um, following the Eagle action level exceedance requirements, we did the source water testing at wells eight, nine, and 10, and they were both, they, all three were negative for lead and copper. Well, six will be tested when it's back online. Um, we're about, I guess, three weeks out from that due to supply chain issues with the pump and section of the pipe that we've ordered. A couple other updates and follow-ups from last council meeting. Uh, Mayor Beaton asked to incorporate public input into the Ramsdell master plan update. Um, Mr. Bradford talked to the consultant. They're gonna include that in the process. Um, Council Member Sullivan asked for the city property listings to be updated. I met with Mike Canuti regarding this. He, ha he plans to have something back to us February 1st. Um, regarding the 12th Street bump, um, Mr. McCoola, DPW director, was they were still working on determining who's responsible, what utility bore, went boring under the street. Um, so they're looking at determining that. I also talked to them about in the spring, regardless, looking at grinding it down with a grinder. So, and then Council Member Grabowski asked about the boarded up River Street storefront. I've been in contact with Mr. Mr. Gordon. They do have, a, we have the judgment that states it has to be completed by the 15th of May. He has some the facade DDA grant and historic district approval. Those timelines are for August. He was asking for an extension. I told him the sooner you can kind of get that property completed, the better. So just wanted to give you an update on that. And we presented the, the blade ad hoc um, information that'll be coming back to council, I believe in the end of February. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Saylor. Nothing, Mayor, thank you. Could you perhaps enlighten the council members in the way of an, an email or something um, investigating Marty Spalding's complaint? Because I, I think I need to see that out in writing with your opinion on it. Absolutely. 
Sure. Thanks. Heather. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. BPW Director. Nothing, Your Honor. At Bradford. Nothing more, Your Honor. Thank you. Fire Chief. Nothing, Your Honor. Police Chief. I don't have anything, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Batman. There are three things. Uh, one, I think I heard you say that you're working on a zoning issue for this issue for the Milwaukee House, and you got a, a resolution to it? Possibly, I'd have to speak with. I think they're looking at adding some exemptions if there's stormwater improvements to the, the parking lot, green yeah, infrastructure. Have to vote on, so we can amend the zoning ordinance? or is it, it would have to be, yes. So I think they're... What's the time frame for that? They're looking at, well, it'd have to go through readings and things like that, but it would be March, early March. Okay. Number two is, you and I are getting all these emails on the tree limb. And you made a solution, a recommended solution that apparently was turned down by the tree commission. And my plan was to work through the tree commission, not necessarily direct the tree commission, but it was, yeah, in talking with the chairman, you know, we did discuss a possible solution. But that solution was rejected? That's my, yes, correct. So, Mr. Sandler had said that we have no authority as a city council to overrule or talk about that event with the tree commission we can't direct the staff to take a tree limb down we have no authority is that what you said george is that uh, i think there? that along those lines when you empower the tree commission to make those decisions they, it's their decision it seems like it's gotten way too personal like it's polarized to the point of because that family asked the city says no and it's been going on for years i personally find it frustrating as heck and I know that some of the people on the tree commission believe that tree should be trimmed. I believe that tree should be trimmed. And at one point I thought maybe we could bring it to city council. The city council could vote on it and put it to rest. But then we're not allowed to do that. So I just, I just find this whole process really frustrating that, that something you and I both think ought to be taken care of. Half the tree committee thinks it should be taken care of, but yet we can't get it taken care of. I find that as a city council, somehow we're losing my knife city council we can get away in it but somehow we're, we're missing the, the the governing by common sense process that we should be using so that i just think that's frustrating to me and my third item is i like jeff um, you mentioned me earlier you're having trouble getting that sidewalk clock can you give us an update on that item that we offered that we approved a purchase of that apparently didn't come through yet what's the status of that you're referring to the second snowblower yeah okay so um i think it was beginning of december first meeting in december um we requested the purchase of a, an additional mini loader with a snowblower attachment and also a v-plow for the front of it um, that replaced a piece of equipment that we used to do sidewalks with and that had permanently failed over the summertime we subsequently auctioned it off um, we took some time to research all of our different options and determined that the a second mini loader, uh, small loader, um, had the most versatility for all of our operations year round. When we asked for pricing on that midsummer, pricing was not available. They had sold out all of the model um, that they were ever going to manufacture again, and then they were switching to a new model. As soon as the pricing came out for that new model, we brought it before council, got it approved. We placed the order the next day and we haven't received it and they aren't able to get us a promise date. Um, what we heard earlier this morning was that when they talked to uh, the manufacturer, the manufacturer just said, we're telling everybody flat out, don't look for anything till March. We don't know if it's coming this month. We don't know if it's coming in February. We don't know if it's coming in March or after that. Um, one of the adjustments that we have made is moving to uh, split shifts. So we're going to work our normal 7 to, th to 3.30. We also are going to put uh, a crew on from, th from 3.30, basically from 3 to 11. And then we'll have a crew on, a larger crew on from 11 to uh, 7. So that way, the one machine that we do have, when it's needed downtown, um, still has multiple hours throughout the day to be able to get the sidewalks around the schools and continue on through the city. Thank you. Did that cover what you needed? 
Jeff, while you're there, is the is the one bridge sidewalks one of the priorities for downtown? The Maple Street Bridge uh, is closed to, pedest to pedestrians right. till spring, um, but US 31 is one of those. When the when the when that plow or snow blower goes out, we try to get around the schools. Then we work on getting the major streets done. Then we go back to the school areas and start branching out, and then go citywide. So, in the past couple of weeks, we haven't had much accumulating snow, so we've been able to get a lot done throughout the city. Um, every time it snows, we reset and start over again. Um, we talked earlier, and other people have mentioned that now there's more pedestrian traffic across 31. So, we did a bunch of salting on that yesterday, um, and I've already sent word in to have some more done tomorrow um if that's what your question. the first what well, was the first few days of the snowstorm you really couldn't walk across the bridge the snow was so deep on it uh that you really had to trudge and it's dangerous obviously you can't walk in the road like you couldn't you know some of the side streets so yeah it just because we don't have two approaches anymore it's probably more important than ever to have it kind of cleared okay understood Anything else while I'm here? Yeah, I got a question for sure. you, Uncle Wade. The um, issue with the the bump on 12th Street, like if you, since we can't figure out who's responsible to fix it, like if you, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice, I get too excited. Um, if we grind it down and then that doesn't work and then we figure out that, you know, they're responsible to fix it and then they say, oh, well, you <coughs> touched it, you you know messed with it now we don't have to fix it and it costs us more money shouldn't we figure out who who has to fix it first? so we since this was discussed I think a couple council meetings ago um, I was able to finally get a hold of somebody um, at AT&T and got the right person um, and I was able to do that right after we had a pre-construction meeting for Maple Street Bridge so um, just piggyback that resource. Um, they were able to go through their construction division, check their records, determined that they um, had done no work in that area of 12th Street in the past two years. So we're pretty confident it wasn't AT&T. We do believe it was um, a, the cable company. And uh, so I've reached out to their construction person haven't heard back. Um, Kathy actually went back and bless her heart, she found the Miss Dig ticket for it. So we actually have a contractor name and I've reached out to them and I haven't heard back from them either. Um, when I was talking to AT&T, I was picking their brain on how in the world could this even happen? And because we've got four inches of asphalt it's protect and eight inches of gravel. It's protected by curb and gutter, so they have to be several feet deep um, to even get a line through and underneath that road, and for it to reflect up to the surface that fast. Um, they said the only way that's possible is if they ran it through extremely fast and and just displaced. Uh, so really, there's no fix to it. There's no fix, you can't cut it out. If you cut it out, you create seams. The seams will create cracking and potholes. So I shouldn't say that. That fix is not good long-term. So what we talked about, or what I talked about with the city manager was possibly profile grinding that. Um, just, we've got four inches of, of asphalt. So that spot's not gonna make it any worse. Um, the other thing is, um, with the heat in the summer, it'll lay down a little bit. Even the plows going over it right now, we'll trim it off a little bit, but I drive it at least a couple times a week and I feel it. So what we're, what we're aiming to do is find the person that's responsible and I'll make them incur the expense to do the repair. So just not touch it for now and until we figure out who's responsible for it? I wouldn't touch it at all until uh, early this summer, if anything. Um, but so we're trying between now and then to find out who's responsible and get them to pay for it. Yeah, can anybody just borrow a street without a permit? I mean, they just go up there and the 
utility companies like the telephone, gas, um, they are permitted through the Metro Act in the state of Michigan to to do that type of work on, within the right of ways. Not a notification to the city and correct. Hmm. Kind of bizarre. Yeah. Usually, when if they're touching any of our stuff, uh, such as um, going to be opening up sidewalks or have to open up the pavement, normally they'll contact me and let me know that. Um, but for boring like this, they usually don't contact us. Um, so my next question, I don't, I don't really know, I'm looking over there, but I'm not sure who I should be asking um, about the whole tree issue. So who has the, who has the final say, like the tree, the tree commission? Yeah, that's who's been empowered by the city council. Right, though. Cor correct. Uh, uh, you, you know, I mean, part of this is, I believe, and I'm, I hear from the property owner contacts my office too, has been the city's policy of people not people that make requests for trimming of trees for their view that the city hasn't acted on that. They act on the standard policy of when do we take down trees, when do we trim trees, but we don't go about trimming trees to assist people with view. I don't know if that's accurate. We're at the council already. We have. <clears throat> we shouldn't even really be. It, it, it's, that. She's come back to council four or five times, probably. But not for us to take action on. It was not a vote. It wasn't on an agenda for us to vote. Correct. I think probably in public comment. Yes. It was on work session at one time. It was on a yeah. work session once. Yeah. Right, but if it's the tree commission, then we don't even have any say. That's my point. I I I get it. I don't understand that. Yeah, I I, I find that we, frustrating that we can appoint a commission. And somehow we have no authority to overrule a decision, but I think we had, at the work session though we did a recommendation to the tree commission, and what they we, said no. Yeah, I think we yeah. we had a concession of we don't want to do it, and then brought it back to the tree commission. There's so much new information out there though in other communities and what they're doing, and and that makes sense to me when I look at it. <clears throat> I know that doesn't make sense to everybody, but I gotta believe too that we tax people's homes based on their view of the lake. To some degree, but yeah, if they have the final say, then that's I mean. Yeah, I get well, it. I just, I just don't agree with it. But yeah, but if I mean, if they her complain, view is not completely blocked, that's part of the issue. Right. But the thing it's is, it's just I one mean, branch that she just sees because you can complain and complain and complain and complain, and complain doesn't make you right. I mean, you just don't get your way. Well, I've been on that road before, but mm -hmm. in this case, yeah. I, I believe that I, if it's not my decision. <clears throat> Yeah, but you can look at it both ways. Like if you're you on the tree commission and you, you say no, I mean, if somebody overrides you, why be on the tree commission? Like you don't, your say doesn't matter. Then I guess if if I can just give a little perspective on this, um, this spring will be my ninth year with the city, and this this request started about eight and a half years ago. Um, it came before I, I put it before the tree commission. The tree, tree commission reviewed it. They did a field trip out to the site, um, discussed it, and it was unanimous to deny that request. Um, the reasons at the time included that it's a public tree, that it's, in, it's a public asset within the park, that um, they actually felt that trimming that tree would not open up the, the view shed and for the intended requested purpose, um, but they also were afraid that other homes along Harbor Drive um, would want to open up views and we would almost have to deforest that side of the park. Um, when the Tree Commission changed members, the request was brought back again and again each time. It's probably been in front of the Tree Commission at least eight to ten times. Um, it's been to all three city, sitting city managers and the interim city manager as appeal and a request. Um, it has been requested of the Parks Commission to intervene and look at. Um, the Parks Commission chose not to, or, or chose to, um, this is years ago, suggest that it, it shouldn't be trimmed um, because it was a public asset. Um, the Tree Commission um, at length discussed the proposed compromise and because this isn't a financial issue, it, it would be very simple for us to trim that and, you know, the money's not the issue, but um, the Tree Commission at two meetings ago deliberated it, reviewed it, and 
one, once again, and, and every one of these have been unanimous, but they voted to not only um, deny the request, but to permanently table it because it just keeps coming back, keep coming back, keeps coming back, and the facts haven't changed on it. And I, the attorney I, said, I know it's been brought to council at least at least four <laughs> times uh, for council to intervene. I do want to add just something. It, it has also been bef before the um, planning commission. Mm -hmm. um, and the planning commission at their last meeting listened to, and I can't remember the gal's name. I think she's the one that's doing the uh, zoning for Onekama. They have some specific language in it in their ordinances that would help clarify this so that there isn't any, any, you know, it's, it's clear cut, you know, you have to be adjacent to the property. Um, it's, there's no guarantee that people can, that this township is going to protect view sheds for people, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's not stated in our ordinance, ordinance exactly. So planning commission, <laughs> um, Nick was, a, you were there. Uh, was on that, and they, they voted to uh, take a look at that language and, and bring it forward. And I think that will help clarify the ordinance um, so that we don't have what, what is the elephant in the room like we do it for one, we have to do it for you know 50 other people. That, and if I can just interrupt for a second, that's an excellent point because the Tree Commission in my tenure has also denied uh, removing trees or trimming trees with views towards Manistee Lake, towards man-made lake. Um, so this is an isolated incident. It's been reviewed pretty consistently, I believe. I'm good. Okay. Good. Aaron, you've been so patient. What would I you do? Nothing. You guys all talked about it. <laughs> Mr. Kowalski. Oh, we answered my questions. Okay, I have a couple. <laughs> um, as you probably are all aware of, um, save a lot uh, at the corner of Cypress and, and uh, Memorial Drive has a sign posted on their door that they will be permanently closed as of January 30th. It's of course called, you know, ignited a bit of a firestorm on the north side um, because obviously that's going to impact some economically disadvantaged people that walk to the store, that, um, that need that, that closeness to a, to a full service grocery store. We don't, there's been no further information. I don't know what it's, what's gonna happen next. I, you know, we've all heard a little bit of information that there's probably gonna be another grocery going in, but we haven't been able, I haven't been able to confirm it in any way. So anyway, I'm just a little uneasy about that situation and I don't know how to, how we can get more information to maybe put something out there publicly to reassure people or give them whatever the truth is behind it. So that's, that's one of the things I wanted to bring up. The other thing is fairly simple. Last summer we talked about putting some signage on the, um, uh, the electric vehicle chargers units, the, the meters that are out there. Did, a sign, did signs ever go up saying that parking reserved only for electric vehicles? I thought you were going to look into that, Chief Glass. I'm, I'm working on that. You're oh, on okay. Yeah. Okay. Did you? Are we going to put some signs up? Or? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Those are my only two issues. Anybody feel left out or want to say anything more? Okay. All right. I need to take them up into adjourn. Motion.